Hi and welcome to Elka Low Carb Ancestral Living with Pim Johnson. Today's guest is someone who has suffered from almost daily migraines for over 10 years, mixed in with major anxiety, major depression and other health complications. And he's now helping other people overcome chronic pain, which we will get into in a little bit. So welcome to the show, Justin. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. Man, when you put it that way, um, it really sounds like I was a big mess. But uh, that's not surprising because I really was a big mess. Um, I, I had a lot going on, especially like the early 20s, late teens and things like that. So wherever you want to start, we, we can start. Yeah, I think it would be good if we could give the listeners an idea of who you are and what you have actually dealt with throughout your life. So if you can just give us like a quick rundown on your childhood uh, until the point at where you were actually diagnosed with um, uh, migraines, because um, you were not the healthiest child in the neighborhood, were you? <laughs> no, certainly not. That is true. Um, yeah. So, you know, it starts really, really young age, like even like two, uh, pediatric asthma. Um, apparently, there's a story where my mother cleaned the bathroom with a cleaner known as Tylex, um, and they had to rush me to the emergency room because my lungs completely collapsed or closed up. So I had to be like resuscitated at like age like two. Um, I was born with oh, jaundice, shit. which is probably uh, pretty fairly common, I think. Um, and then, you know, throughout, I mean, I was probably on regular antibiotics starting at age probably five or six, you know, uh, throat infections were a big thing, ear infections um, when I was really little. Uh, and then the stomach issue started, you know, early teens. That's kind of when I'm more conscious, you know, um, when you're a kid, it's it's hard to remember all the times you were sick because you just remember being able to stay home from school. So you're just happy about it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just remember, you know, my having these sore throats, these throat infections, having to stay home, having to take. So over here in America, um, the amoxicillin was like bubblegum flavored, which probably means it had sugar in it. And I guess that's to get kids to take the antibiotic. So I remember constantly drinking, you know, my bubble, you know, they called it my bubble gum potion or something like that because I was a kid. So I was constantly having to drink this little pink drink of, of this, these antibiotics. And this, this would have to be at least twice a year, if not more. So I do remember that. And then in my early teens uh, or, or tweens, you know, 11, 12, like that, um, one thing I remember is a severe case of gastritis. Uh, my stomach just completely locked up on me. I couldn't go. I couldn't throw up. I was just in constant pain for two weeks. And they said it was gastritis, which is kind of like a pre-ulcer. At least that's the way it was explained to me. That was gnarly. I got mm -hmm. mononucleosis at age 14, even though I really didn't kiss anybody. And I was down for a couple more weeks like that way, too. Um, I had these horrible sinus infections where, like, speaking of dating life or the non or having a non-existent dating life, you know, I'd be I'd be trying to be cool. I'd be kind of sick, but I'd feel like I was OK. Right. And then, like, I'd be drinking like a Dr. Pepper and then. I would just sneeze and this green snot would like, you know, go over like this chick I was talking to in my soda. It was just, it was a gnarly mess. Like, man, it was just, Ooh. just not cool. And, and so like just my sinuses could produce an incredible amount of green mucus. Um, it was like, I, I don't know if you've ever seen Ghostbusters, but Slimer. It's like I had Slimer <laughs> yeah. living in my sinus cavities, basically. That's how bad it was. So still was getting throat infections. Um, yeah. And, you know, I was eating standard American diet. So, you know, cheeseburgers, um, meatball sub, sub sandwiches from Subway. You know, I come from a broken home. And so when you come from a, a family that's separated, you eat, you eat out a lot. Right. And so not a lot of home cooked meals. A lot of McDonald's, you know, I would, I would go to my mom's on the weekend because it's the weekend, Friday night pizza, 
Saturday night pizza, uh, Sunday cheeseburgers. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Which is pretty, that's why it's called the standard American diet, right? Unfortunately, that's <laughs> not uh, uncommon. And then, of course, at school and middle school, you know, the, the, the lunch, the prison food they serve you, you're happy on Wednesdays because they serve pizza. You know what I mean? Um, and and I was in, so in high school, I did manage to get into like cross country and track. I did running. So one thing about me that's probably different from other people is that I've always been thin. So I've never had the overweight problem. And so when you don't have the weight problem, everyone just guesses you're, you're healthy. You know, I... I was in cross country. I was in track. I was a decent athlete. I wasn't like top tier or anything like that. But I, I was, you know, um, high middle, you know, um, and, and I enjoyed it. But, you know, I would get these weird like Achilles heels flare ups and then the sinus infections, missing practice. So I feel like my health did hold me back from being able to compete at a higher level as an athlete, you know, that my spirit that I could have. Um, but, you know, no one ever really thought there was anything really wrong with me. Um, now, the mental health side, that stuff was also early. Like, I was probably <laughs> had, like, major depression from age, like, 10 or 12, just because of a lot of family conflict. You know, I, I've been through a lot. Um, and, yeah, like, just straight crying, a lot of constant crying at night. Um, which feels weird as a boy and things like that and just feeling misunderstood and, you know, a saving grace being like heavy metal bands and things like that. Um, but yeah, I was, I was depressed. My anxiety would be so bad that I would, I would walk home from school and it was like a two and a half mile walk or something like that, which isn't huge, but it's a good hour walk, hour, hour, 20 minutes or whatever, you know? And um, yep. I, if someone was, was on the same side of the sidewalk as me and walking towards me, it would give me such bad anxiety that I would have to cross the street. Like I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. like cross paths with people. I don't know what that was about. Even though I'd be wearing headphones and like a sweater or whatever, or like have my gym bag from doing cross country. I don't, I, and it took me years. Like it wasn't until I was like a full grown adult to realize that was just like panic anxiety. Right. Um, so, yeah. so I, I just like generalized anxiety, generalized worry, but I was never like <laughs> worried about my grades or things like that. I, I think it was just, again, family chaotic home and, and trying not to be vague, but let's just say, um, I've seen both my parents in jail or in prison at some point in my life you know, said that going on, broken home, um, you know, deaths in the family when I was young. Uh, yeah, so it was a gnarly time, uh, you know, and I don't, and I'm not saying that like pity me or anything, but just looking back, it's like, oh, that's why like that was so stressful. You know, that's why you kind of had these issues or stuff like that. Um, you know, kick, kicked out of my yeah. dad's house at age 16 you know, over some stupid crap, just, just real stuff, you know, but you talk to anyone else growing up in LA and that's LA life, you know, Los Angeles, California. <laughs> that's just, the, that's just the role of it. Um, wow. and, uh, yeah. And so the mental health stuff that certainly didn't help. And the health stuff I'm sure is all related. Um, so, you know, I did not to mention, uh, in later high school, so like junior, sophomore year, I get into illegal substances. I start doing, you know, drugs, basically doing a lot of partying, which on one side I feel like helped me be more social. But on the other side of that, you know, here I am doing more damage to a system <laughs> that's already overloaded, yeah. right? Um, and, and so it's just all kinds of craziness. I think everything together... And I am getting to the first question. Everything together, eventually, boom, get hit with migraines at age 20, you know. Um, and the reason why I know they're migraines or why they were migraines the first night, and I just distinctly remember this night, just a random night, the right Oops, side of my head. Be... Hang on. Can we stop for a second? Yeah, <laughs> I can hear you. 
You you disappeared. You distinctly remember. Describe the migraines again, but I I lost you for a bit there. So I missed the beginning of that. You distinctly remember what they were like because that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me now? You Am may I continue. Back or? Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 You're back. Um, so I di- I distinctly remember the migraines. The first migraine. Uh, because I had just gotten a new job at this Halloween store and the right side of my head, I just remember this tingling and this headache and lights bothering me and sound bothering me and just like, ah, and like I couldn't sleep. It was just absolute pain of like a nine or a 10 all night long. And And I had an inkling as to what it was because I have two sisters that would get migraines. So I had heard the term, I'd seen the kind of pain my sisters were in, uh, my, my older sisters, mind you. Um, so I knew what it was. So, so I call my sister and I know she has medications or she gives me one of her pills and it goes away. Go to urgent care, also get, well, it doesn't go away. Um, it's still kind of there. I go to urgent care like the next morning. I obviously don't get the job, right? Because the first day I was supposed to show up, <laughs> I call out. Um, so yay for that. Um, and yeah. uh, go to the urgent care. They give me a bottles of like Tylenol 3 because they can't prescribe anything stronger because it's stupid urgent care. Anyway, um, I end up downing like the bottle of Tylenol three, like literally I, I drank an entire bottle <laughs> of Tylenol and passed out for an entire day. This was what I did. I woke up the next day feeling better. I think a couple days after that, I talked to a neurologist. Uh, she puts me on Maxol, which is one of the triptans uh, for migraines. And from that day forward, I mean, I was popping Maxol every other day. You know, which is a bummer because they only give you nine of the pills. Well, those are dissolvables. Those are actually kind of cool. So they were dissolvable max salts and they only give you nine a month because migraine medication is addictive. And also um, what it does is contracting the vessels in your brain is not good for your brain and causes brain death essentially over time. And so as a migrainer... (laughs) you're stuck in this really effed up situation because you're in pain and you want to take the medication, but you're in, so it's, sorry, it's three way effed up. Okay. On the medication, you're instructed to take the medication as soon as you experience the migraine. Now, which sounds like a good idea. The problem is is that once you take the migraine medication, you're not functional and you need to go lay down or something because it just kind of knocks you out. And you get these weird sensations from it. You get weird tactile stuff. I remember my tongue would go numb on me and I couldn't eat or taste. Like you get all these weird sensations because again, it's going after your nervous system. It's constricting those blood vessels in your brain. So that's gonna have all these kind of weird effects throughout your entire body. Um, and so you don't want to take it right as it prescribed because you don't want to go through that and you might have actual things that you have to get done. On top of that, you want to preserve the medication for when the migraines are really bad because you only get nine doses a month. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) And so you're 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 stuck with this crazy weird decision of like okay how bad is this migraine going to get what do i have to do what do i have to do tomorrow because once i take this i'm not going to wake up until late tomorrow because i'm going to be all dragged out and everything i mean it even says on the migraine medication you know don't drive <laughs> after you take it well if you have a migraine at work and you take it what the heck are you supposed to do <laughs> you know what i mean um So it puts you in all these weird, awkward, stressful situations, which don't help a migrainer because stress, again, is a cause of migraines. (laughs) And so you have to do all this different kind of complications to your life, you know, even dealing with the medication. Um, Now, they did give me what was supposed to be a preventative medication with it, but I had these other weird psychological effects with it. So I, I immediately had them take me off that. Um, my neurologist, which to her credit, was like, listen, if you keep taking these tryptans, this Maxalt medication at the rate that you're taking, 
you're going to end up with seizures by age 40. Now, at this point, I'm age 20. No, thanks. So in two, in two decades, they were, she was telling me, hey, you're going to get seizures, most likely. And it's like, well, that's worse than getting migraines on, on a couple of different levels, right? Getting, getting seizures. And she was open to kind of more nutrition and supplements to treat it and stuff like that. So did kind of like a migraine diet thing, which is like you, you avoid sulfates, you avoid like almonds, you avoid um, like tomatoes and histamine foods and things like that, which was which kind of helped, you know, and I got on some good supplements and things like that. So I was able to drop the migraines uh, down to once every four or five days or so. Um, but that's still kind of not really functional, you know, and I, and this pressure, like this head pressure right on the right side of my paint, uh, right side of my head would kind of always be there. Like it was like this, this subtle headache. It's hard to explain, but as if someone took like a bicycle pump on the right top part of my forehead, and I was just like every once in a while squeezing air into there. Really, that's the best way I can describe the sensation. Um, so went along like that for a while, um, eventually saw a natural path and got into, uh, you know, did allergy testing, got on, I was taking like 13 different supplements at one point. I was taking like 5-HTP, magnesium, um, the, um, what's it called, uh, fish oils. Um, I was taking like a, um, a, a bovine like steroid or hormone. I was taking, she had me on a whole bunch of different stuff and it was expensive, but it was helping. Um, it dropped my migraines down to a week, week and a half. She also, to her credit, put me on a um, paleo diet. So I went gluten-free, dairy-free. And that's how I treated my migraines uh, for a good six years, roughly from age 24 to age 30. Um, and I just kind of, you know, I changed some supplements out, found cheaper companies, things like that. But I was able to, you know, go to school, get my bachelor's uh, degree, start on a master's program, hold a job. You know, yeah, I, I sometimes knock out on the weekends and things like that. And yeah, I was still struggling with the occasional migraine. But once a week is head and shoulders above like almost like heaven compared to daily migraines, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I still didn't feel well though. I was still struggling with some carpal tunnel. I was still struggling with sinus infections on occasion. Um, so my natural path did kind of help with that. I mean, she, she said avoiding dairy would help with that. And I think it did a little bit, but also, uh, she, she had me do like, uh, high mega dosing of like vitamin C when I was getting the migraines. Uh, I'm mean, not the migraine, sorry, the sinus infections. And I think that helped me get over them a little quicker. Um, so there are a few different things, you know, it was still better than, than regular medicine. Cause by that point I was like, I'm done with regular medicine. You know, I've done nothing but listen to them and I've done nothing but get worse. Basically, um, roll yeah. back just a little bit, um, with the sinus infections, uh, eventually I think it was age 23. I did have sinus surgery. So my sinus cavities are actually empty. They're completely stripped. Because um, they, they said that my, my sinuses were so bad and so chronic, I begged them. I got an ear, nose, and throat specialist to do the surgery. Um, so yeah, there's nothing inside my nose. <laughs> I'm waiting for my Michael Jackson moment, you know, like when his head, when his nose fell <laughs> off. <laughs> or like my own rhinoplasty yeah. or something. Um, and so, but, and when they did the sinus surgery, they told me, oh, this should completely get rid of your sinus infections. You shouldn't have any issues anymore. You should be golden from here. I was like, sweet, let's do it. You know, inject me, do whatever you got to do, cut me up. You know what I mean? Uh, yep. I don't care. And um, I, I swear, I swear, man, within six weeks, I got a sinus infection. And I went back to that doctor and I was like, you SOB, like you told me, they're like, well, 
With some people, it doesn't work. And what we have to do, and get this, this will blow your mind if you've never heard this before, get this. We'll just cycle you on and off antibiotics every six weeks. And it's like, by that, that time, I had, known, I had known how bad antibiotics are for the gut biome and all that stuff. I was like, F you, no, no, done. Like, no, I'm not cycling on and off antibiotics every six weeks. That sounds completely insane. <laughs> I would be a walking vector for immuno uh, and resistant viruses and bacteria, basically, at that point. You know, mm -hmm. I would be yeah. creating an MRSA, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and so I told him no. And, and so, yeah. And so anyway, we we'll skip forward a little bit, you know, six weeks or six years of paleo. Um, I was dating a, a vegan girlfriend at the time. And so we were kind of doing like a vegan paleo thing for a little bit. I had seen fat sick and nearly dead. So I got into juicing, got into plant based. I was having my kale, you know, <laughs> I was having my leafy greens. Yeah. I was having my apples. I mean, my, my breakfast every morning was a green smoothie, carrot, apple, kale, spinach, chard, um, like cacao or something, green smoothie, oh, gluten-free, vegan, organic waffle, um, and like some other fruit. That was my breakfast. For years, that was my breakfast and thinking I was doing the right thing. Um, that and I eventually switched to like the Orgain vegan protein powders. I was doing those. I've done the, um, what was it called? I think New Earth or Earth Garden uh, vegan protein powders, uh, meal replacers. I was doing those at one point as well. So anyone who talks about plant-based, been there, done that, didn't do jack. I'm just telling you that, you know, I did my spirulina, like all that stuff, been there, done that, did the raw, you know, with the fiber, without the fiber, you know what I mean? I've been there. I, I did that, you know. So if it doesn't work, why, why did you continue for years? Um, well, my, my, my girlfriend at the time believed it worked, you know what I mean? Well, because psychologically, <laughs> because you're told you should feel better, that like you think you feel better. If that makes sense. Like, you just think, mm -hmm. oh, well, if I feel this bad like this, adding in meat or adding in other stuff will only make me feel worse, if that makes sense. So it's, yep. it's so psychologically overtaking of like, oh, if it doesn't taste good, you're supposed to eat it or eat the rainbow, all that stuff. You know, I was, I was yeah. all in it. And I believed it. And, and yeah, even if you're not getting better or, I mean, I can't say I remember specifically getting worse, but remember I started out in a pretty bad spot. So kind of didn't really have anywhere to go except up. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, it's just psychologically you're told that you should feel better and this is the right way to do it. So you think that you're doing the right thing even though the results, you're not getting what you think or what you're promised, you know, even doing it for a, a good six months, a year, whatever, you know, um, I, I would say that's, it takes over, you know, that's why I don't blame people that are in it. Cause it's like been there, done that. Once you get burned out five, six, seven years, give me a call. Cause that's what it takes. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a little bit curious because um, I've heard that you are following Angela Stanton's uh, protocol for migraines, and I'm just wondering how you got into that. Yeah, that is, so uh, very far from green juicing. <laughs> right, exactly. So I'd kind of I dropped juicing like quite a while ago. Me and that girlfriend, you know, we broke up, you know, and stuff like that. We kind of were growing growing apart. Um, so I kind of my meal on my own was kind of more like chicken stir fries with rice, still a bunch of veggies and fish sticks and like organic fish sticks and like organic, like chicken tenders. <laughs> Those are my views. And, uh, <laughs> and like organic popcorn. Like I was addicted to popcorn since I was gluten free. Like, you know, I didn't really do a bunch of like, well, I started to, but 
snacks and gluten-free treats and stuff like that. Um, popcorn and uh, sprouted organic almonds were like my heaven. Like those were my go-to. I was going through like, you know, the large bags of popcorn, like the huge ones. I was going through like three of those like a week of like this organic popcorn, gluten-free. And I thought I was eating well, like for real. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like my, that was my Netflix, you know, smoke it, light up a joint um, and have, have this popcorn and watch Netflix. That was my <laughs> evenings or, or do some gaming, you know. Oh, I'm healthy, oh, you know, funny. with like a, an almond butter or like, or like a sunflower butter and jelly, organic jelly sandwich, like for real. <laughs> Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and like, hey, I'm healthy. I'm doing it right. Hey, it's gluten free. It's paleo. It's all good. You know, with the sprouted bread or whatever, vegan bread, gluten free bread, whatever. So terrible. Um, and so doing that. And so what happens is, is, uh, around uh, late March of 2019, I get in a really bad car accident. Um, basically, I'm in a Toyota 2010, and I have a Ford Explorer that ends up in my back seat on the freeway. Put it that way. Um, completely tore up from the floor up, uh, just ripped to shreds. Um, nothing broken um, except for my spirit and my soul. Um, and uh, the migraines, the chronic pain just flares up. I mean, it is just yeah. un freaking believable. I'm like, I'm back from, I'm back to square one. What I'm doing isn't working anymore. And I could feel that I had damaged nerves between my C6 and C7 of my neck, which is now confirmed. I've got a herniated disc, you know, in my, my lower neck now. So that's fun. Um, and, uh, you know, so what does anyone do when what they're doing doesn't work anymore? You turn to the internet, right? And I was like, well, it's been a long time mm -hmm. since I've seen what people are doing about migraines. Um, I go on Amazon, I think, or end up somewhere. And uh, I kind of come to this little crossroads of you have Angela Statton's book, uh, Curing the Migraine Epidemic. Then you have, I always forget his name and I feel bad for forgetting, but uh, Migraine Miracle. If you just look up Migraine Miracle, he does like a high fat keto approach. Um, it was just by luck that I just chose Angela's book. I buy the book. I start reading it. I get in her Facebook group. Um, in the Facebook group. Um, now, I don't know how far you want to get into her protocol. Basically, I'll just explain the basic theory. Her theory is, is that migraines yep. are an electrolyte disorder in the brain. So basically, you have the dendrites and the neurons. And the neurons can't fire or can't jump correctly if there's not enough sodium or sodium potassium balance for the neurons to jump across the dendrites in the brain. That's the quickest way I can explain it. It's a bit more neurotechnical than Sweet. that, but that's the basic idea. Um, and so she believes that the migraine brain or the ancient brain, whatever you want to say, um, burns through sodium very quickly. If you notice, I talk kind of fast. I kind of move kind of fast. I'm a little keyed up and things like that. Just I've always been this way. Um, and so that's why the migraine community and the autism community, I feel like, are related because a lot of the sensory issues that you hear from the autism community, a lot of us in the migraine community also experience. So I wear these, those that can see if, they, if there's a visual here, I wear blue blocker migraine glasses because these lights and everything just kind of, it's too much for me. I am photosensitive. Um, Sound, yeah. even though I like hard rock music, you know, sometimes if I'm not in the right space, sound can bug me. Textures, um, things like that can, can kind of throw me off. Smells is a big one. Um, a lot of migrainers report olfactory issues and senses, smelling things that other people don't smell or perfumes completely wreck me. You know, I would, I would get severely ill from smelling perfumes. Um, so... And all of that in Angela's theory is due to the reason why we have those symptoms is due to the brain being overstimulated and not having enough sodium to process. So you greatly increase your sodium. Um, now, carbohydrates uh, and sugars disrupt 
uh, your body uh, processing sodium. And so it's like a double thing. So you do, if you're having sugars and carbohydrates, you're depleting your body of necessary sodium um, and you're generally not getting enough because you don't know that you have a migraine brain and that requires more sodium. So which is why, you know, the pain is actually the end of the migraine, the light sensitivity and other symptoms. Sometimes it can be uh, insomnia. Sometimes it can be tiredness. There's a bunch of different symptoms um, is actually the beginning of the migraine. And so the, the disruption in the dendrites and in the neurons cause a cascade in the brain leading to the, you know, restriction of, of the blood flow, the flaring of the blood vessels in the brain, causing the eventual pain. But you have a series of other called prodromes um, that are symptoms leading up to the migraine, and then the pain of the migraine, and then the relaxing period, and then the cycle kind of starts all over again. Yeah. So that's... Right. So, so what... Oh, go ahead. No, I just find that very interesting because... Not everyone, but a lot of people are trying to go on a low sodium diet because they have a little bit of high blood pressure or whatever. Do you think that they are literally putting themselves at risk for developing migraines if they have this specific type of brain genetically? Or could that apply to anyone if you are restricting sodium enough? Um, my guess would be that, I mean, if you have this brain and you know, you, you might get migraines at one point. You know, migraine is a, is a catch-all term for many different symptoms. You know, it can be aura. It can be even slurred speech. It can be, like, hallucinations. It could be vertigo. There's some people that get no pain at all. They just get sick to their stomach and vertigo, which anyone that's ever experienced... I've had vertigo a couple of times due to migraines, and it it's, it's worse than a migraine. You know, not being able to be oriented to where you're at is terrifying. You know, it can be cyclical vomiting um, can also be a migraine symptom as well. And so my guess would be if people have that brain, if Angela is right, if you sat down and talked to these people and really ran through all the different kinds of migraine, uh, you would probably be able to line that up. You know, it's just hard to say without talking to each individual. But yeah, the, the, the high blood pressure thing, I mean, that's, that's just silly. <laughs> you know, we, we got the science yeah. on that. It's not caused by the sodium. It's caused by the, the you know, insulin uh, resistance, you know, and the metabolic disorders. But yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, I, so when you started with the, uh, Angela's protocol, what, what did you do? And how quickly did you see results from it? Yeah, so... Um, I, I started, you know, I started increasing my salt uh, daily. That's how I started. Um, I kind of tried doing it more keto in the beginning. I was doing like tuna with avocado salads and things like that. Um, but she has, she's really strict on macros. And like, I was not hitting macros, like at all. And I just <laughs> couldn't figure out how to hit them. I, I'm not a math person. I'm a verbal emotions and mental process of person. I'm not a math person. And then in her group, I see all these people talking about ZC and CD. And I'm like, what the hell does ZC mean? What does CD mean? What kind of code is this? You know, obviously anyone that listens to your, your, your show might already know. Um, but it's ZC is zero carb and CD is carnivore diet. And when I learned that, I was like, oh, I know what that is, because coming from the psychological field, um, being a huge fan of Jordan Peterson, hearing about his daughter, Michaela Peterson, and her carnivore diet, I had heard about it in 2018, so a year before discovering Angela. I was just too scared to try it at the time. Because when you have migraines, when you find something that kind of works, you hold on to it for dear life and you're so scared to change mm -hmm. anything. You know, it's like, ah, anything I do will make it worse, you know, especially coming from the plant-based stuff and things like that. So like, you know, I heard about carnivore diet and I started like increasing my steak consumption, but also increasing my ketchup consumption, which probably wasn't <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> um, and... <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, 
I, uh, yeah. So then once I was like, that was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, you know, okay, fine. I'll cut the ketchup. I'll just do the steak. So the first like carnivore ish meal I made was like a, a sirloin steak with, uh, zucchini and yellow squash. Cause those are supposed to be like the super low carb, super low oxalate, what have you, vegetables, you know, and like mushrooms. Because in the beginning, you feel like you need that variety because you don't really understand any of this yet in the very beginning. Um, and I did that and it was great and, and I was pretty happy. And so my first month, and people have to understand, my first month of carnivore was horrid. It was absolutely terrible. I'd never want to go through that again, but people have to understand I was recovering from a horrific car accident and having migraines. Now, Angela's protocol is a no meds protocol. You are not, well, I don't want to say not allowed, but you're not supposed to take your rescue medication because taking the rescue medication further damages the brain and doing the angiostatin protocol, a keto protocol, uh, carnivore diet is about healing, right? And healing the brain. So you don't want to be damaging the brain while you're trying to heal the brain. So I, I, I literally essentially had a migraine lingering or just pain that entire first month. Um, now, what made me keep going is that even though I was in pain, there was I distinctly remember this one day, this one hour it literally asked, lasted for an hour where my mood felt good. I actually felt like not happy, but content and energy for this hour. And it was, I'd never felt it before in my life. I had this crushing depression, like I said, like age 10 or 12. And I was like, whoa, that's different. Why do I have energy? Why do I feel good? Why do I want to like, you know, clean up or whatever? You know, it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's different. That's weird. And I've been on all different kinds of drugs. And like, it felt really nice, but not in that highway. It was just decent. It's like, is this what other people that don't have my issues walk around feeling like? Like, wow, this is amazing. And it literally lasted an hour. And I was like, all right, that's different. That there's something happening here. And then it kind of gradually, like a few days after that lasted for like an hour and a half or two hours, you know? And it's like, I'm still in pain, but I'm starting to have energy and my mood's getting better. And those, that was the big shift for mm -hmm. me. The next big shift, I want to say towards the end of that first month, was my migraines 98% of the time are on the right side of my head. Um, why that is, why it's all, all usually on one side, I don't think anyone's completely figured that out yet. Um, now, mind you, when I was four years old, I fell from a stool, like a four-foot stool, and landed on my head on my right side. I still have a scar and was uh, rushed to the emergency room. And my head had to be, my skull and head had to be stitched back uh, when I was four years old. So maybe, maybe something to do with it. Maybe uh, an, I'm, I've been doing more research and it seems that er, a lot of people have early childhood uh, TBI or traumatic brain injury uh, at a very young age, what can affect their mental health and physical health decades later. So just something to think about. Yeah. Um, I certainly had that with that incident. I think it would be, I think it was hard enough the way everyone in my family describes it. I mean, I was apparently gushing blood out of my head, four years old. Um, I guess my aunt nearly fainted. They had to rush me to the hospital, um, you know, and, and I had to get stitched up, you know, um, and yeah. So possibly, you know, had they done an MRI, which I don't think they did. I mean, this was like 1993 or something like that. Maybe they would have seen something. Anyway, side note. Um, so, but I remember towards the end of this first month of carnivore on the left side, having this migraine on the left side instead of the right side, but it was like a more duller pain. It wasn't as painful. And I thought, whoa, that's different too. So I had these little weird emotional, mental energy shifts in where the pain was, changes towards the end of the first month that was like, all right, I'm on to something. There's got to be something here. I'm going to keep doing this. And it's only gotten better. Um, you know, 
by month three, um, I, I eventually had, I was getting migraines, but they were going away. They were starting to last like only one day or only like half a day. And I started doing weird things. Like um, I remember the Joker movie had just come out and I had a migraine like the entire night before. And I, I learned to sleep with the migraine, which is kind of funny. And I'd wake up and have energy, even though my head was hurting all night. And I woke up and I was like, screw it. I'm going to go see the Joker movie. So I woke up from having a migraine all night, took salt water. Um, I don't remember if I ate or not. I think I was doing three meals a day in the beginning. So I think I had ground beef and eggs and cheese or something like that, uh, which would be my typical breakfast in the beginning. Um, and I went to the movies, right? And so you would think as a migrainer, Having a migraine and going to the movie sounds like a horrible idea. It's dark. It has loud noises. You're going to have like an emotional reaction. You just got the bright screen. By the end of the movie, my migraine was gone. By the end of the Joker movie, you know, it's like two and a half hours or whatever, right? Um, and I thought, that's cool. That's really cool that like <laughs> I was in pain. I went to the Joker movie. I went to a movie. And at the end of the movie, I was no longer in pain. Like, that's something different. And what it taught me is that for me, yeah, I, to this day, I still get the occasional migraine, especially if I eat sugar or eat off carnivore or if I do go through something really emotional or if I'm not getting enough sleep. Yeah, I, I'm still a bit of a glass cannon, but 100 times better. But what I know is, hey, within a day or a half day, it's going to go away. And I'll be cool again and everything will be cool. And, and, and what happens is I'll have the pain, but I don't have the depression that came with it. I don't have the anxiety that came with it. I don't have the fatigue that came with it. I can sleep through the pain, you know, um, and wake up and go to work the next day. And to me, I call myself migraine free. And the reason why I call myself migraine free is all of those reasons, the way less of impact that they have on my life. But also, I haven't taken a Triptan, the migraine rescue medication, since July of 2020. And so I threw Yay. away, I threw away all my migraine medications, you know, and I had all the, because when, when you're, when you're a migrainer, if you do find some kind of relief, you stock migraine medication, like a squirrel preparing for winter. Like you stock it up. It's crazy. You know, it doesn't matter if it's expired. Precious. You don't care. Yeah, exactly. Precious migraine <laughs> medication. Yeah. And it, that was a tough day. Like it wasn't easy, but I went a solid year without it. And when I was able to go a year without taking this, the triptans, I threw it all away and I haven't looked back and I've been good. And I've been able to, you know, go to the mountains and do all kinds of crazy cool stuff. Um, and yeah, it's it's I feel free from the beast, you know, from, from, from migraines. And it's amazing. They don't rule my life anymore. You know, this interview, right? Hey. I, I, I worked I worked a shift, you know, a whole eight hour day on the computer, typing all that stuff all day, answering phones, dealing with difficult people. What name you? What have you? Um, <laughs> setting up and scheduling and being like, yeah, cool. Let's let's do this interview would have been nigh impossible. I would have been wiped out probably would have had a migraine or scared of a migraine. Not to mention the story would be a lot more crappy because I'm not a person that had healed, <laughs> right? Um, and so, I mean, just all the different ways it's opened my life. And now being able to coach and, and walk other people through this migraine journey or a chronic pain journey, because I got pack pain I, I deal with. I got neck pain I deal with, you know, but hey, I'm still working out three days a week. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the gym before I was exercise intolerant because I was scared of migraines or, or in pain or something like that. So I owe my life to Angela. We disagree on a few things, I, but I owe my life to Angela. I praise her. I praise her name, you know, like like a savior. You know what I mean? Um, and I praise the carnivore yeah. diet. I praise myself for sticking to it for every day, uh, choosing it. You know what I mean? I don't always 100% make the absolute best carnivore choice, but I, I, I know what makes me feel the best, and it's certainly beef, salt, and water. And when I do get a migraine, I'm missing either beef, salt, water, or sleep. 
that's the cure. So if you do have a migraine now, you just drink some salt water, eat some beef and go to bed. Yeah, generally, yeah, I do have the ice beanie that goes over my head. But yeah, for the most part, mm -hmm. it's drink salt water, eat some meat, go sleep. Yeah. So how much salt are we talking uh, about here? So I do now it's a little different for everyone. Um, but I do a one uh, 16th teaspoon of salt uh, per eight ounces of water. Um, about, I don't know, six, seven times a day. I've, I've done the math before. It comes out to something like five, uh, what is it? Not milligrams, but five, five, five to seven grams a day. I'm probably getting of, of salt. Um, for the average person, general rule of thumb is to balance your potassium from meat with your sodium from salt. Um, but being a migrainer, you want to have a ratio roughly of two to about 1.8 sodium to potassium. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sweet. Depending. So uh, you said you're not necessarily eating the best carnivore diet. So I'm just a little bit curious. What do you eat? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on occasion, and I don't, it's not stuff I do on purpose. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll make pork ribs and um, I will, the, the Primal Health barbecue sauce, oh, I'm in love with that stuff. The Hawaiian barbecue sauce, I'm in love with that stuff. You know, I don't seem to react, but I, I know I'm playing Russian roulette with it. Um, you know, it's mainly like eating out. So if I go to a restaurant, like I'll do something on accident where like something I'll have some kind of seasoning and I'll take a bite and it'll be like really sweet and I'll be like, oh, F, this has sugar in it, but I'll keep like eating it anyway. You know what I mean? Like oh, I'll pay for it in a couple of days. It's fine. Or mm -hmm. my most recent one was uh, I ordered. So uh, over here they have a restaurant, Chipotle, which I really like. And you can get chipotle carnivore and it's pretty easy to do but they had a new brisket like bourbon or whatever thing right so of course i order it because i'm me and i dig in and i'm like oh this is really sweet this must have sugar and like two days later i was wrecked so it's not something i do technically on purpose it's mostly just you know balancing the eating out you know balance um and probably most people would still consider that carnivore you know, I, I get that and everything, but it really messes with me like two days later. You know, other people, they, they are like, how do you stick to it? And for me, it's easy because if I don't, if I literally am not, I hate using the word strict. If I'm not that health conscious and pro what's loving for me to eat, pro health, yeah. I'm in pain. And I'm in pain for a good day and a half to two days. So... And, and it's, and it's, a, it's a, and it's so easily avoided, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I just feel, not that I feel like an idiot, but it's just like, uh, you're gonna, we're, we're doing this yeah. again, huh? <laughs> you know? Um, and so there, there's, there's a, there's a list of different foods that I've done that with soy sauce, mustard, um, just seasonings and things like that. Mostly I have no issue with eating just meat. It's, it's the, right. the little spices of life, right? And so maybe, maybe that'll heal more later. I don't know. Um, but if it doesn't, I'm, the level of health that I have now, which is something I try to instill in the clients and the people I work with, is like, even if this is as healthy as I get, I know I still continue to improve and there's other things I'm working on. I believe I've already reached like my pinnacle of health, even though I feel like I'm so blessed and so happy and so grateful for the level of health that I have in this moment, that even if it doesn't get any better, I am yeah. happy with this. And that's pretty awesome, to be fair. But I'm, I'm just wondering, in the beginning, did you miss other foods? And do you feel like this is a sustainable diet and I can continue eating the rest of my life? Or are you planning on trying to go back to eating more spices or whatever it is that you're missing? 
Yeah, um, you got to understand, I think, and this is probably something that a lot of people that come from other, you know, whether it's paleo or keto or vegan, once you're used to saying no to certain foods, once you've done that for, you know, like I said, I was paleo, partially vegan, plant-based for, you know, six years. And so once you're used to saying no to things, you're used to not really going without, but it's just you don't miss it. You know, I, I, I haven't had regular cream ice cream in a decade. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I don't miss it. And I don't, you know, as a kid, as a teenager, Oreo cookies and cream or a McFlurry or something like that was like the bomb, right? And I don't miss it. You know, I don't crave it. And I haven't, like I said, I haven't had regular ice cream Good on you. in over a decade, you know, and I don't miss it. That's, that's totally fine. Um, pizza, I really don't miss. Um, yeah, it's cool. It smells good. I mean, donuts, the smell of donuts, <laughs> that's rough. You know what I mean? On the right day, man, am I tempted. That, that, that's a killer for me. I haven't done it. I haven't had a donut in, geez, I don't know, probably close to a decade as well. Probably haven't had a donut. So, you know, you got to understand, when I came to Carnivore, I had already said no to a lot of the craving foods that a lot of people already eat. I was actually excited about carnivore. Carnivore opened things up because I can have dairy now. You know what I mean? So I make my own ice cream, you know, and that doesn't affect me and I'm fine. So it's not that I can't have any ice cream at all. Yep. It's just I make my own, you know, and when it comes to the carnivore diet, um, there's awesome chefs out there, people that are doing just i didn't know they could do that with the meat and dairy you know what i mean make people making some of the most outrageous creations any craving you're having can be made carnivore now is it going to be the most cleanest strict healthiest absolute mega mega best best ultra ultra carnivore well no but when you've been rolling in this a year when you've put in your time you know people are like well, I want to do this for six months or blah, blah, blah. I, I tell people, you're a baby carnivore <laughs> until you've done two years in this. Until you've done a good two years, nah. Like, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to complain about it. Give me two years. That's what I tell people. Give me, give me a solid good two years. You know, and then you feel it. I believe the true healing takes a good couple of years, honestly. Um at least a year, but I, I'm really more at that two year where real you feel really like you've gotten real healing at that mark. So, I, yeah, I don't I don't crave it. You know, I live on my own, so like it's easy for me. I just don't buy it. You know, I just don't buy anything yep. that's not me. You know, that I I just don't buy things that I'm gonna react to. Pretty much, you know, I like my cheddar cheese. I like these different kinds of steaks. I love my ground beef. I do a bit of chicken, although I got salmonella recently from that, and that was a bummer. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely happy in this diet. I'm happy I get to have my cheese. Is it probably the best thing? Ultra, ultra, mega, mega, <laughs> pinnacle, super, ultra carnivore that I'm having cheese? No, but it's a trade-off, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm healthy enough with cheese and I don't feel like I'm going overboard with it, but I know people struggle with dairy. I know people struggle with cheese and you got to find what works for you. You know, one of the funny things about me going from that first steak with the zucchini and uh, the yellow squash with the mushrooms to just steak is that um, one, I'd, I'd like eaten like that for like a couple of weeks or a week or something like that. And I just started eating the steaks and the the mushrooms and everything else went bad. Yeah. And I just didn't buy them again. <laughs> you know, I just I was like, I'm just not going to buy food that's going to go bad that I'm not going to eat. Like, it just seems to make sense to me. So, and it was been easy since since then. And, you know, there have been a fun, a couple of fun things. Like, when I went hiking in Mount Shasta with a group of friends, we had this, this restaurant up there. And they had fries in, made in duck fat. You know what I mean? It's like I had to have a fry dipped in ketchup made from duck fat because whenever am I going to able to do that? You know what I mean? And I don't remember that messing with me, you know, but 
learning to limit myself to just one fry. Now I know there's other people where that one fry, yeah. it would have been over for them. They're done. You know, they couldn't have stopped there. But I just, I'm just saying I'm just blessed in that I don't have that problem. I have other problems, yeah. but that's not one of them. Sweet. So I know that you are helping people in a group setting with uh, who have chronic pain. So do you want to talk a little bit quickly about what it is that you do there and how you help people? Yeah, so I am a, well, Meet Our Ex, which is now Rivero Health Coach or Carnivore Coach, or I don't even know what they're calling it now. And uh, me and a, a few other carnivores have been um, running for over a year now, uh, about once a month on Sundays, or once, once a month, the third Sunday of the month, um, a chronic pain meeting, and um, attendance is, is decent. Um, and so... What I try to focus on there is forgiveness and mental and emotional. And when I say forgiveness, uh, those of us with chronic pain, um, we feel like, especially if you've been on this diet for a while and on a healing journey and all that, if you have a flare up, like me, I still get migraine flare ups. Um, there's a my friend Amanda that's in there. Um, she has fibromyalgia and occasionally she'll get a fibro flare up and there's this automatic impulse to feel bad about yourself. Like with me, with that Chipotle, me getting that migraine, it's real easy to be like, that's your fault. You're an idiot. What are you doing? You shouldn't be getting flare ups anymore. Come on, you're healed now. You're better than this. Like I can rip myself yeah. to sheds, but that doesn't help. Right. So again, it's about that forgiveness and appreciating the level of health that you have, despite having the flare up and resting. If you do have a chronic condition, rest. It's okay, you know? You're still healing, you know? Take a nap. I'm a napper. I yeah. love naps. You know what I mean? I love to take a if I if I get the opportunity to take a, 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 a an hour nap, yeah. that's the best. And when I was more unwell, I couldn't nap. You know what I mean? Because I had too much anxiety, depression and other stuff going on. Now I have the mental calmness and the clarity to take a nap. You know what I mean? So if you need a nap, take it. Um, you know, of other people in there that, um, you know, she there was a woman that had been in a severe motorcycle accident and was still taking uh, opioid medication. You know, and she's like, I really, really want to get off it. And I'm like, look, that's nerve damage. That was a horrific motorcycle accident. You know, if you need the opiate, like I know it's a bummer, but don't beat yourself up over it. It's okay yeah. if you need that medication. You know, if you've tried other things or if you're trying, you know, like opiates are hard to get off of. A, B, that's one of the most horrific, uh, you know, and I've been in some gnarly car wrecks, right? And so when I hear someone's story about a car wreck or a motorcycle accident or something, it's like, no, that's, that's trauma yes. to the body that we're not designed for like it's way 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 out of range of what kind of punishment our body's meant for so it's okay you know maybe maybe later you can get off of it maybe through this diet and a few other things maybe at some point but if at this moment in these weeks or months or years you truly need the medication it's okay to take the medication you know if you truly need it, and I truly believe, you know, you come into me talking about it, you need it. And that's okay. And so that's why I start with that forgiveness. Because in the chronic pain community, for we're, our body's in pain, but we feel like beating ourselves mentally and emotionally will make no. it better. And it doesn't. It only makes it worse. And so my first lesson in there is always to forgive yourself and be open and honest about it, you know. Um then after that is, you know, like I said, talking about flare ups and being OK with that and, and the healing journey and letting it take place. And and, you know, oftentimes coming into this, we're not going to get the results that we were immediately looking for, especially not in the beginning. And so I always tell them, OK, but try to look for other things that are different. Is your energy level? How's your sleep? Um, how's your how's your how's your emotional mental health? How are you dealing with stress? 
you know, I can, and then I get them to list off five or six things that are doing better. You know what I mean? It's like, you can't heal focusing on what's still wrong. The only way we heal is to focus on what's healing. You know, it, throughout that time, that first month, had I focused on that migraine that entire first month, I would have hampered my own healing. Instead, I looked for what was different. I looked what was going right. That is the only way to heal is you yes. have to look at what's going right. Because I guarantee you, if you're on this diet and following it in appropriate fashion, because don't get me wrong, there is a way to do carnivore wrong. Yep. <laughs> you can do this wrong. I've seen it. And people actually really hurt themselves if they do this diet wrong. I will say that. Sadly, um, talk to people, do this right. If you do it right, give it six months, give it a year, give it two years, but you will notice different changes. I damn near guarantee it. You know, it may not be the changes you're looking for, but it will be other things. And, and I think usually the energy and the emotional are the two things that seem to come first before the chronic pain or they'll develop different chronic pains or you know, and I, I, I encourage them to keep a diary or keep a journal, you know, because um, uh, we're so forgetful, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're so we, when we learn that how big of an impact food has, whenever we do have that flare up or whenever we do have, you know, something go wrong or something like that, we're so quick to, oh, that steak must have had some kind of bad oil in it or it was this or that. And I'm always like. All right, maybe, maybe, but let's not attack the healing food. Let's back this up a bit and, and track this and see, hey, uh, did you get some bad news? How mm -hmm. was stress at work? <laughs> How did you sleep the night before? Um, have you been getting out sunlight? You know, I walk them through it because, again, okay, you had the steak. And maybe it had some kind of soybean oil or something, but you decided to go out with friends or you decided to do that. And that was at that moment, that was the most loving and the most healing food choice that you could make at that moment. So once you've made it and you ate, ate it to go back and demonize it, that's not helping you move in a healing yeah. direction. You know what I mean? Now, again, maybe I'm willing to consider it, but we have to take everything in context. You know what I mean? And that's what I try to do is give people that broader view because we know the steak is going to be more healing than anything else that's on that menu. So to me, that's like the free scare, uh, free space and bingo. You know what I mean? It's like, let's not attack yep. the meat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, let's let's maybe, but let's look at these other causes for why you had this flare up or why, you know, whatever was going on. And usually there was other things going on, right? Because it's never just one thing. I know we all want to boil it yep. down to just one thing, but it's never just one thing. Now, just the body doesn't work that way. Okay, awesome. So if people want to get hold of you or work with you or get into this group or whatever, where can they find you? Yeah, so um, the best place to find me is... Uh, alloutlife.carnivore on yep. Instagram. If you type that in, it's alloutlife.carnivore on Instagram, but also on Facebook, um, alloutlife.carnivore. I'm also on Minds at alloutlifecarnivore. And at, if you have, go to allmylinks.com slash alloutlife.carnivore, I will be there as well. And um, I'll try to throw links yep. towards Pim we'll that you that. can uh, put in the show notes and stuff like that as well. Also, do a weekly podcast with the Meat Mosaic. If you go on YouTube and look for Meat Mosaic, uh, I am there with the other group of great carnivores. We got Bart on there. We've had Paul Mason on there. Uh, we've had Pim. We've had you on there. Um, I think we're going to have you on again soon. That'll be awesome. Uh, but yeah, it's also a great way to meet, uh, get in touch with me as well. There's all my links awesome. and stuff. And you're doing that uh, podcast or YouTube channel together with Tom that has been on my channel very recently as well. So there you go. Thank you so much for coming on here. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> Do you have any last words that you want to share? <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, uh, I just always like to go back to forgive yourself. 
love yourself and forgive yourself. You've been through enough. Stop beating yourself Yay. up. You're done. All right? You're on a path to healing. Amen. Just forgive yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Been fine. <laughs>